What's up guys, it's Chili. Today I've got another civilization concept to talk about. This one's gonna be for the Khmer Empire. Now this is one that I have been hyping up for a little while now. Uh, and I finally get to talk about it, and I'm so excited to go through this concept with you guys. Uh, some of you guys may have already read it when I posted it onto Reddit, but for the folks who haven't already seen it, uh, I'm going to go ahead and walk through my design thinking for this amazing civilization, and I'm going to argue why I think this should be definitely included as one of the next civilizations added to Age of Empires 4. Uh, now, the Khmer in real life are located in Southeast Asia. They're known as Kambuja to their own people, which is where we get the modern term Cambodia from. And Cambodia is nestled, it's a landlocked uh, country that's nestled right in between Vietnam, Laos, uh, Malaysia, uh, and it is a relatively unknown uh, country in, in the modern world. Uh, a lot of people might have heard of the Khmer Rouge, that was probably their uh, most famous uh, and significant event in recent history. But uh, long before colonization and the world wars and communism and everything, we had the Khmer Empire. This was an empire that dominated Southeast Asia, took over large parts of Thailand and Vietnam and Laos and basically controlled uh, that entire region of the world for a period of time um, until they were ultimately beat back by the rival kingdoms around them. The Khmer are known for a lot of things in history and I'm going to be going over that in this concept as well but as I'm imagining them in the game they will be known for three main things which are wetlands, siege, and elephants and I'm placing this as a two-star difficulty sieve. Um, wetlands is a very distinct aspect of uh, Khmer um, uh, geography. Uh, it's nestled right in the heart of the Southeast Asian jungles um, and I think something like, what is it, 30% of the land is comprised of wetlands and floodplains. And so uh, for the people living in this region, they had to adapt and come up with uh, unique ways to uh, survive in that terrain. Um, and I want to represent that in this civilization as well. Actually, just briefly before we get into all that, I just want to talk about this artwork here. Um, this is how I'm choosing to represent uh, the Khmer. Um, this is, you, you see this Khmer warrior up here. Uh, maybe he's like a kingly figure, obviously standing in front of the legendary Angkor Wat, a very amazing looking, or at least something that is a representation of Angkor Wat. This is just an uh, image generated through Mid Journey. Um, and you can see also this uh, this kind of like flooded area over here, kind of a reference to the floodplains uh, within Cambodia, as well as like the berets that they built um, all around their temples. Berets are basically these large open air water reservoirs that's very unique to this region. There's really, really if you take a look at Google Maps and look into um, like where the Angkor Wat is, there are some really, really massive uh, man-made reservoirs, all square-shaped or rectangular-shaped, uh, all around it. Um, it's a really interesting uh, piece of. Uh, of human construction and engineering. Um, I also added in these elephants because the Khmer are, are known in past games, especially in AoE 2, for their elephants. Uh, elephants did not come, they did not come with the mid-journey uh, generation. I had to add these through Photoshop myself. Um, and I added some of these gold blur lines as usual to make it kind of fit with the AoE 4 theme. Um, so uh, I'm talking through the passives for the civilization. Uh, so their, their first off is their influence mechanic, the wetland empire. So as mentioned before, much of the terrain is covered in wetlands in real life. So as a reference to that, Khmer town centers will be spreading wetlands as a terrain modifier. So this is the first time, at least I'm proposing here, that it would be the first time that AoE 4 introduces the concept of a spreadable terrain modifier uh, in the game. And so, uh, this means that Khmer structures excluding walls on the wetlands will chain the influence and spread wetland from their position. In this includes structures not initially built on wetlands. So you can, for instance, set a house uh, not on wetlands, but then once your wetland spreads to that house, that house will now be a spreader of wetlands as well. Now you can obviously imagine what this is inspired by. It's inspired by the Zerg creep from StarCraft. So uh, I think Zerg creep is a really, really cool design, uh, and it made the Zerg plane such a unique way. In this case, I'm imagining wetlands as functioning very similarly. As the Khmer are spreading out their empire, they're, they're actively spreading their wetlands terrain modifier, and that gives them bonuses while also hurting enemies, the same way uh, Zerg creep does. And you can imagine these wetlands as basically like a combination of all the hydraulic projects, uh, all the ways that the Khmer uh, dealt with the wetlands in their terrain, uh, whether 
there be dikes and dams and canals, berets, all those things all combined together is forms into this concept of wetlands. And now the way this will work is that it will grow over time. So starting at a radius of one, it will slowly expand uh, each minute up until a max radius of eight. So this would be the first uh, influence mechanic in AoE4 that would actually grow over time. And then when you kill a building, just like with Zerg creep, uh, it'll slowly uh, fade away uh, until in, until eventually disappears uh, once it's disconnected from the source. Um, in this case, sources being the Khmer town centers. Uh, up next is Khmer architecture. Structures on wetlands will self-repair when out of combat. Uh, and some of your techs will also provide wetland related bonuses. So this is obviously very related to the way Zerg creep uh, makes Zerg buildings slowly uh, heal themselves. Um, I guess in that case, it's kind of like an organic uh, type of being. Um, but in this case, it's just, you can imagine the way the Khmer people built their structures are just very resilient to uh, thriving on wetlands. So or very resilient to the problems that wetlands provide. So they self-repair. That's just, uh, you can kind of use your imagination on how that would work. Um, floodplains. Enemy structures on wetland will passively take damage over time, including stone walls. So this works very similarly to uh, the way Zerg creep works. And I think it's interesting in that um, if you spread out your, your uh, wetlands properly, um, you could even siege down enemy stone walls without needing to actually bring about any siege. So this, although I imagine that the damage will take would be very, very minimal uh, and take a very long time, but this just gives you some options to spread out your um, terrain and make it harder and harder for the enemy to defend themselves uh, as you're spreading out your wetland. Um, up next is Jayavarman Highway. Uh, Jai Varman uh, was a, uh, a very famous king uh, within the Khmer Empire and he built a well-connected series of roads all over the empire and uh, filled them with stations that would house and take care of weary travelers and so this is kind of a reference to that. All Khmer military units here, including siege units, will move 20% faster when traveling on wetlands. Now again, this is this is borrowed from Zerg creep. Zerg units in that game uh, also move faster when they're traveling along creep. Um, I just wanted to maintain that same identity here. Um, and then next up is early siege workshop. So uniquely, uh, no other civilization in the game does this right now. Um, the siege workshop will be available to the Khmer starting in the feudal age in age two. Uh, and this allows you to construct two uh, particular siege weapons. So normally you only get rams and I guess siege towers available in H2 for every other civ, uh, although no one ever built siege towers. In this case, the Khmer also get a unit known as the Ballista, uh, and uh, we will talk about that here. Uh, the unique unit, Ballista and Ballista Elephant. Uh, this is a really special and awesome unit. It's a reference to the unit that we see, the same unit that we see in AoE 2, uh, which is what the Khmer are known for, the unique unit, the Ballista Elephant. And the way it works is that the Ballista will replace your Springhold. Um, and it's a cross between a Springhold and a Maganel. So if you remember, the um, there's actually in Age of Mythology, there's a unit that the Norse get access to called the Ballista as well. It's their like main siege uh, weapon. Uh, it shoots three bolts at a time, and those bolts kind of land in a, in, a, in a spread out formation. And so I'm imagining this Ballista working in a similar way. Uh, you, can, you might also remember, um, what was it called? Uh, was it? The Cairo Ballista. There was a Cairo Ballista for the Atlantean civilization as well, which also shoots a bunch of arrows that kind of spread out. Um, I'm imagining that same thing for this unit in particular as well. Uh, the Ballista uh, still serves as the Springhold in that it does counter uh, siege to a degree, but because their shots are spread out, it means that they can also kind of function a little bit like a mangonel. Um, and but it but this also means that it's not as quite effective as an anti as a dedicated anti siege the way a Springhold is, uh, but it gives you some options. Uh, it's kind of like how um, the Manjanik for the Ayubids uh, can use the fire weapon, uh, which makes it which makes its uh, attack more spread out and better against buildings, and so it's more of a hybrid role in that sense. Um, the Ballista Elephant is obviously just the same thing, but now mounted on an elephant, uh, giving it greater mobility and um, also allowing it to uh, uh, reposition uh, and uh, reduce the um, setup time uh, or negate the setup time in this case. 
Uh, and then lastly is the springle, uh, sorry, the uh, ballista emplacement. So instead of a springled emplacement, um, you will now get the ballista emplacement, which is obviously better against groups of units. Um, and yeah, that's it. The, the unique units are the ballista and the ballista elephant. Um, everything else is relatively simple with this faction. Uh, let's go over their units next. So in the archery range, we have the archer, crosswoman, and I'm giving them the tower elephant. So right now, the tower elephant is actually a unique unit for Delhi, but as we start adding other civilizations, um, such as the Khmer or like the Vietnamese, maybe even the Majapahit, hit, maybe another Indian civilization like the Tamils, uh, you can imagine that we'll need the elephant unit to be a little bit more generic. The same way, say, a Rebaldequin is available to multiple European civs, or the, um, uh, uh, um, what was it called? The Culverin is available to, uh, to multiple civs as well. There are some units that are um, semi-unique, where uh, only some civs will have them and some civs won't, but they're not specific to that civilization. I'm imagining that war elephants and tower elephants will have to fulfill that role sometime in the future as well. So in this case, the tower elephant is available in the archery range. It functions very similarly to the Delhi tower elephant, but uh, Delhi does have access to a bunch of technologies. Um, so that's actually one thing I wanna make clear here. Uh, the way Khmer will deal with the elephants that will be distinct from Delhi is that Delhi has technologies that uh, allow their elephants to be tankier and uh, more powerful in combat. They can be buffed up by their scholars, which makes them even stronger. Uh, Khmer instead will have lighter elephants that aren't as armored. They don't have the armor technologies that the Delhi Sultanate has, but instead they can take advantage of things like the Jai Varman Highway, where they can move faster. Um, and there are other bonuses here that can also make the elephants a little bit faster, and we'll we'll talk about that in a little bit. In this case, the um, <clears throat> the uh, uh, tower elephant also won't get uh, crossbow uh, um, crossbow archers or crossbowmen. Uh, the Delhi Sultanate uh, can be upgrade the Delhi Sultanate's tower elephant can upgrade their archers on top to crossbowmen. Uh, and then they can also have um, hand cannon, a hand cannoneer version of the tower elephant as well. Uh, for the Khmer, instead of having all of that, they can add this thing known as a side carriage, which adds one additional archer. So instead of just two archers on the top, you can now have three archers on the top, which is also an extremely powerful technology that they'll get access to starting in the castle age. Uh, and as you can see here, uh, there is some historical basis. This is uh, a relief, uh, il an illustration of a relief that was found on one of the Khmer temples. Um, <clears throat> In this case, uh, depicting archers riding on the sides of the elephant, not only on the top. Um, so I think that's a neat little historical reference. And lastly, in H4, they'll they'll get access to the hand cannoneer. This will just be a standard hand cannoneer. Uh, the Khmer historically, if they even had hand cannoneers during the main empire period. Um, they weren't that significant. I think the Khmer Empire had fallen by the time hand cannons were a thing. Yeah, their empire uh, basically fell by 1431. And then uh, there were some um, Khmer slash Cambodian resistance fighters uh, that helped actually, that allied with the French when they were first trying to colonize the region. Um, so perhaps you can imagine like a later ver later variant of a Khmer hand cannoneer appearing um, and just kind of use your imagination there. Uh, for the barracks, uh, there are spearmen and men at arms. Uh, very standard, but the one thing here that's interesting is the FICAC. I think that's how you pronounce it. I have no idea how to actually pronounce it. Um, <clears throat> uh, the FICAC is basically a, it's a very interesting, unique weapon that's unique to the Khmer. Actually, as far as I could tell, no other um, no other empires in the region, either the, be they the Thai, the Mimis, the Laos, no other empire seems to use the Phycac. This is like a distinctly Khmer weapon. Um, it is a, it is this kind of like axe, sword, halibird, almost falks like weapon, kind of like the Dacian falks. Uh, I have a clip here somewhere about um, depicting, uh, here we can show this perhaps. Uh, here is an example of uh, a modern day FICAC being wielded by a Khmer man. Um, so you can get a, get a sense of how that uh, how that works there. Uh, but the way I'm imagining this is that the FICAC will be a um, an upgrade to the men at arms. It will give them increased attack range. So you can think of it as kind of like a two hand sword, but now uh, it's you know at the end of a stick. So the men at arms now have increased attack range, allowing two rows of men at arms to attack at the same time. This is very similar to the way the phalanx ability uh, allows multiple rows of spearmen for the bosses to attack at the same time, making the uh, Khmer men at arms very unique 
uh, very uniquely spammable uh, because multiple rolls of men in arms can hit at the same time, uh, which is great for their DPS. And you might not have a common imagining of what a Khmer armored warrior looked like. Do they even have armor? Were they just living in the jungle half nude? Well, turns out no, they had plate armor and this is what they look like. Uh, something like this. These are examples of uh, Khmer officer warriors. You can also see example of these large tower shields in the back. And then another thing I want to call out uh, here is this unique uh, spear. This is something that we see represented on some of the Boz reliefs for uh, Khmer temples. Um, it's kind of like a a very interesting, almost like plant looking uh, spear. I'm not exactly sure how this works, uh, so I didn't make a reference to it in this concept, but perhaps the spearman could have a unique looking spear that um, does something cool, uh, or this could be a technology as well, um, although I didn't represent it here in this case. Uh, all right, so let's next look at the stables here. Uh, the stables is also pretty simple. Uh, uniquely, the Khmer will not have access to knights uh, or lancer units. Um, so there is uh, uh, basically there. These this empire is living in the jungle. Uh, it's very hard to sustain horse breeding within that kind of environment. Historically, they had very very little cavalry. Uh, maybe only some people would some very important uh, nobles might ride in ride into battle on a horse but most likely they wouldn't even fight on top of the horse. Uh, although there is some evidence of, say for instance, this bas relief right here, which depicts um, a, a warrior, or in this case, maybe like a warrior a deity uh, riding on a horse, in this case, wielding a Fikak as well. Uh, so uh, I that's for that reason, I gave uh, the Khmer this technology called Nayars, which is a reference, Nayars essentially references the uh, the warrior elite uh, class of the Khmer Empire. Um, and <clears throat> in this case, it gives Khmer horsemen uh, plus one, plus one armor for both uh, melee and range, and also gives them plus three attack. And their unit now wields Fikax. So this is uh, kind of a way to make their horsemen uh, somewhat of a hybrid between a horseman and a lancer uh, to give them just a little bit of an advantage um, but when they get to castle age they can have access to the war elephant again the war elephant is going to be very similar to the Delhi war elephant not as tanky but faster moving um, and so they don't quite have a unit that fulfills that lancer role but their elephants kind of help out um, and fulfill some of that uh, heavy cavalry role sort of uh, or the horseman can be adjusted to that uh, the siege workshop is the interesting area though uh, with this faction which is in my opinion really unique because not many other civs in the game right now care a lot about siege maybe the ottoman empire uh cares about siege that's like the only one i can think of that um has a lot of unique siege weapons so in this case the ballista is uh available in h2 um as mentioned before, this is their replacement for the Springled, and then in H3, get, they get access to the Ballista Elephant. Uh, it has zero setup time, and now can move while reloading, uh, so it, you can potentially even kite with this Elephant. Although I can imagine there be ways that maybe it's too slow moving uh, to really make a meaningful difference. Uh, I still think that this is a pretty interesting way to get around the issue of, like, like since ballistas are weaker springled, um, the, it does make uh, late game springled battles a little bit more difficult. But then when you get the ballista elephant in, in line, um, the ballista elephant's gonna be tankier, it can move, it can kite a little bit better. So potentially this gives uh, the Khmer even more ability to win the late game with springles, uh, in the springled battle, even though they don't have access to uh, as strong anti-siege springles. Uh, this ability, uh, Rapid Fire, is a technology available also in the Castle Age. It makes the Ballista or the Ballista Elephant reload twice as fast. So it's a it's a ability that's specific to the Ballista uh, units. And then Elephant Handling is another technology I'm giving them, which increases elephant move speed by 15%. So uh, as mentioned before, the theme with the elephants here is that they're semi-cavalry. Uh, they're, they're sort of like a cavalry unit to a degree. Um, and so... Uh, they don't, um, they're not as tanky as the Delhi elephants, uh, but they move faster, not only 15% faster here, but also another 20% faster when they're traveling on wetlands. So you can have potentially very fast elephants if you are playing this faction right. And uh, the fact that you also have potentially three archers on your elephant means that you almost have like Mongudai level uh, uh, tower elephants that can just kite around and, and never be taken down. So there's a lot of unique gameplay potential here, which I think is really, really exciting. Um, 
the rest of their siege is pretty straightforward mangonels trebuchets and bombards uh, they don't get access to the culverin or the um uh, uh ribaldequin just because uh to my knowledge there's Khmer did not have a strong gunpowder presence in the later periods uh the the double bow is an interesting is an interesting technology though um this is actually based on this uh uh evidence evidence that we saw uh of of the Khmer double crossbow being used uh, in some illustrations. I think there's some speculation on whether or not this is actually ripped off of a original Chinese design. In any case, there were depictions on Khmer um, temples of using this kind of double bow, this double crossbow. Uh, and so in this case, it gives um, ballista, which includes uh, elephants and emplacements, plus one range, uh, giving them even more advantage in late game sprinkle fights, making them much more better uh, for um, uh, kiting and, and getting the first hit out. So the siege area for this faction is definitely the main powerhouse of this faction. Uh, and here's a couple depictions of the Ballista Elephants. Um, it was also a unique unit for uh, this faction in AoE 2. Uh, this picture over here on the right comes from another game that I really like. It's called Humankind. It's kind of like Civ. Um, they have the Khmer in that, in that game as well and they have access to this Ballista uh, Elephant. Um, highly recommend this game if you, haven't, if you haven't checked out Humankind. I think it's a much better version of Civ than Civ is. Uh, and then lastly, for the additional technologies, uh, there's not going to be too many te technologies here, but um, uh, these technologies you can imagine them being available in, say, the university or even um, uh, e even like uh, uh, the monastery or something like that. I'm not sure, but um, these are just various other econ bonuses. Uh, that uh, make the Khmer play uniquely on wetlands. So one is stilt houses. Houses will provide additional population, five population, if they're built on wetlands, uh, which means that you will want to think about how you're placing your houses and make sure that they're not only spreading wetlands, but also uh, not only on wetlands, but also spreading wetlands. Um, and then next up is beret irrigation. When you have farms on wetlands, you will gather faster as well. Um, this is a pretty straightforward benefit. It makes uh, Khmer farmers a lot stronger uh, and uh, it just encourages you to, encourages you further to spread wetlands. Uh, Dharma Salah is an interesting technology. Um, it is a reference to these uh, these rest houses that were stationed all along the Jaravarman uh, Highway, um, and uh, uniquely, uh, the these were these were actually like a a very unique quality of the empire at the time. Not, this is not something that you see in a lot of other empires. It kind of reminds me of the Tambos that belong to the uh, Incan Empire. Uh, and the idea here is that when you build an outpost and it's on a wetland, uh, you can now passively heal nearby units. Um, so this is a very uh, a, a unique way to play. You can have forward outposts potentially or um, uh, some kind of forward base that allows you to heal your units. Very similar to the, I think the Abbasids get a technology that allows their keeps to heal uh, nearby units. So similar idea there. Uh, and th this picture is an example of a traditional Khmer house um, uh, that's built on stilts. Uh, a lot of Khmer houses uh, were built on stilts to avoid uh, flood damage because there would be constant flooding in a lot of the um, uh, Khmer uh, geography, uh, Khmer terrain. Uh, and, I, and I just gotta say, I love the way the houses are designed. Just like look at these like very distinct and unique uh, pointed arches um, and this like uh, floral up here that's very similar to like Chinese architecture, but also like very unique in its own way. It's, it's got a very distinct look to it. Um, very, very Cambodian, <laughs> very Cambodian look. Uh, I really like that. Um, all right, lastly, let's talk about the landmarks. So, uh, uh, Khmer is going to have a very basic uh, age up mechanic, uh, very similar to many other civs, so uh, nothing too fancy here. Uh, and I included a few uh, uh, famous uh, temples and architectural landmarks that stand today, uh, but it's not too important what exactly the historical reference is. It's more important that um, the gameplay element is preserved, at least in my opinion for this concept. So don't be too much of a stickler on uh, whether or not this building makes sense for the, up for the uh, ability. Uh, so. Uh, first off is the Kokur complex. This is a temple complex that's in Cambodia. Um, a, a lot of, by the way, a lot of the Cambodian temples and ruins have this like really exotic looking um, uh, uh, kind of overgrown aesthetic to it. Uh, this is a a a, um, a byproduct of building a empire in the jungle. Uh, keep in mind that when the Khmer Empire was active, 
their buildings did not look like this. They did not look like these uh, stone ruins with trees growing out of them and, and moss covering everything. Uh, instead, they were painted. Uh, a lot of these structures were, um, you know, polished marble with uh, with 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 color uh, on them. Uh, and when back when the empire was active, it was actually after the fall of the empire that you know a lot of the jungle uh, basically retook the land and um, grew over a lot of these structures. And a lot of these things fell into disrepair. Uh, fell into disrepair as the Khmer people were not able to access um, their traditional sites. Uh, and then only much later do we finally get access to, do, do they finally get access to this, these regions again and try to preserve them. Uh, so for that reason, you kind of see this look. I think AoE 2 right now has the Khmer and their architecture kind of looks like this overgrown stonework. Uh, it's not an accurate look. Instead, they should really try to go back go back and revamp it to make it look more historically accurate, as pristine as it, as it once looked. It's kind of like how... Um, uh, Greek temples. We now know that Greek temples were actually painted and colored. They were not just white marble the whole time. Or Roman statues, for instance. They weren't. They also weren't just. Um, uh, or I guess some Roman statues were austere and and just white marble. But Greek statues certainly were painted over uh, commonly. Um, anyways, uh, moving on to the uh, mechanics here. Uh, Coker Complex. This is a age two siege workshop. So. Uh, it's kind of like how the French get access to a stables immediately with the uh, School of Cavalry. The English get the Council Hall, which is an archery range. Um, this is a age two siege workshop, and uh, all the siege engines that you produce here will deal additional damage per attack. So this obviously uh, blends really meshes really well with the ballista, as each of your bolts will now deal additional damage, um, giving you a lot of early game uh, uh, fighting potential, even though you have a siege workshop. Obviously, having siege workshop, uh, having a siege workshop saves you the need to get the siege engineering technology from the blacksmith, so if you do decide to play for early aggression, you could just pump out rams from this uh, building directly. Uh, and, and not to mention build ballista that can help counter some of the archer mass that your opponents might be fielding. So, a lot of really cool opportunities with, uh, with this landmark, I think, uh, that makes it play very uniquely compared to every other Civ in the game. Uh, next up is the Raja Vihara. Um, I don't remember if this is, the, I think the actual name might be a little bit different, or this might be the historical name, uh, and the current name is a little bit different. I don't remember what the name was now, um, but this functions as a lumber camp. It's kind of, um, it's kind of similar to how the, uh, the Ottomans get access to a, the landmark, the Twin Minaret Madras, that, um, uh, constantly spawns berries, uh, or the uh, Japanese get access to the um, uh, uh, the name is escaping me right now. But the landmark that is constantly spawns farms. This is a landmark that will constantly spawn trees. So trees will passively grow here, and they can be harvested. And it emits an aura that increases nearby wood gathering by 15%. So um, basically, a really great landmark for going for wood. Uh, it synergizes really well with say. Uh, the beret irrigation uh, technology which allows you to have better farms so you could do your farm transition much earlier uh, potentially uh, it obviously synergizes with spreading wetlands because you can build we can get more wood that spreads uh, that allows you to build more buildings that allows you to spread more wetlands um, and it is great for uh, also doing early aggression if you need the wood to build rams or if you need wood late in later stages to uh, build your siege weapons uh, as mentioned before siege is going to be the central center is one of the centerpieces of this civilization uh, up next is in the castle age, the Priya Vihar. Uh, this is a castle kind of built high up in the mountains, kind of in the sky. I thought that was a really cool uh, looking landmark. Uh, so I wanted to include a reference to it. Um, this uh, functions as both a keep and a monastery. So uh, a bit of a a bit of a powerful uh, structure here. Uh, it allows you to uh, go straight for your relics if you wanted to, um, and allows you to control a lot of territory. So, um, uh, pretty straightforward. Uh, all structures within the same contiguous wetland will also gain increased fire armor. So just a little bit more defensive um, uh, for uh, uh, improving your buildings um, and, and making them a little bit tankier. Although I don't think that's going to matter too much. Uh, the main thing is having a keep and a monastery at the same time here. Um, the other landmark is the Royal Beret. So this will grow fish, uh, shore fish, passively. Um, this is a pretty powerful mechanic, I think. Uh, it, again, is very similar to the Ottoman uh, Twin Minaret Madrasi, which spawns uh, berries passively. Uh, 
Uh, this allows your villagers to have a constant source of food around the beret. It is also a wetland influence source. So instead of just your town centers being an influence source, this beret uh, landmark will also be an influence source. And on top of that, all the wetland influence contiguous with this landmark will grow twice as fast. So and, and have a maximum spread radius of 10 instead of just eight. So this is the main kind of wetland buffing uh, landmark. Uh, it makes the wetland spread faster. It makes it spread farther. Um, and it is another source of spreading it. So a uh, very powerful landmark if you really care about spreading your wetland, uh, which I think is a really, really cool thing to, to add as well. Um, it doesn't give as many bonuses uh, up front that you might need. So for instance, like having a keep in a monastery immediately is obviously gonna be a huge power spike, but um, having this uh, increased wetland spread is gonna be a more slower over time uh, kind of benefit. Uh, in, 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 in the Imperial Age, we have the Bayon, uh, which is um, this really, 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 really cool looking temple. Uh, probably the second most famous temple complex next to the uh, Angkor Wat. Uh, it has these, uh, uh, I think like Buddha faces or maybe they're like royalty faces uh, carved into these uh, 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 structures here. Uh, very, very exotic and ominous looking. And I think I, I can, I cannot imagine what this would look like painted and in pristine condition. Um, it must have looked amazing at the time. Uh, and to this day, it still looks incredible, um, but just uh, almost has this kind of like creepy ethereal feeling because all these uh, faces are now uh, faded out. Uh, anyways, uh, this is a elephant buffing uh, landmark. All of your elephants now have the Devaraja's blessing uh, and gain an additional 20% HP. Devaraja is basically a god king, uh, which is kind of how the Khmer saw their king. Um, and uh, I guess in this case, he gives a blessing and your elephants gain additional HP and the ability to passively heal even while in combat. So the Delhi Sultanate gets elephants that can be healed up uh, with scholars. Uh, this is something similar. I don't imagine the healing to be as powerful as the Delhi Sultanate's healing, um, but just a, a way to give the elephants a little bit more survivability uh, in this case. Obviously great for um, a late game elephant build if you wanted to go in that direction. Uh, the other landmark is the Golden Mountain. Oh, and you can actually see here. So this is what it looks like today. But as you can see here from this reconstruction, uh, there used to be a giant Buddha, uh, or maybe, uh, it maybe it might be on the other side of this thing actually, because uh, I think there are some ruins of the Buddha still standing today. But there's, there's a giant Buddha that's reclining here. And then just look how beautiful this, this, this temple looks. Um, these uh, these temples these temples were considered sto stone mountains uh, back then. You can clearly tell why. Um, the uh, the coloring the 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 the, the shiny marble like it, it looks so cool. And to, to know that like this thing used to look like this back then is, in my opinion, really 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 exciting. And I wish I would love to see this represented in game, like a like a fresh Khmer Empire as opposed to like this kind of faded uh, jungle style of Khmer Empire. Anyways, this is the landmark bonus. So e each of these kind of uh, landmarks on the bottom here kind of benefit. Um, uh, uh, spreading the wetlands. Sorry, this is the wetland bonus. I don't know if I said landmark bonus earlier or not, but uh, yeah, each of these all spread the further in improve the way you spread wetlands. And in this one, it, you can now reap the benefits of having a really uh, massive wetland uh, territory. So passively generates gold based on the amount of terrain covered by wetland up to a maximum of 500 gold a minute. This number, thinking back on it, it's, this is a little bit unbalanced. This is like, this is like, oh my god, this is like six relics worth of gold, perhaps, or maybe five or four. Anyways, this is, this is a little bit crazy, but so maybe it's 300, whatever. I don't have a strong preference on what exactly the number should be. Um, I'm just imagining that this is a con uh, this is a way to constantly uh, get rewards in the late game uh, for spreading out your um, your wetlands. And, it, and if you get this landmark, it makes the Khmer a little bit less reliant on gold mining in the late game. The Khmer do not get any bonuses towards trade, uh, so this is potentially a way to supplement that. Um, and lastly, this is the wonder. Obviously, it's going to be the Angkor Wat. This is the wonder for the Khmer back in AoE 2 as well. Uh, it's also what you see the Khmer get in other games like Civilization. Um, very, very, very famous uh, landmark. Uh, it's 
actually the emblem on the uh, flag of modern day Cambodia, a very distinct temple. Uh, I've never visited in person, but I definitely want to visit this uh, at least once before I die. Um, uh, it, it just, it looks so, it looks so beautiful and it's the perfect representation of uh, Khmer architecture. And it's kind of incredible to imagine a uh, thousand years ago, um, people building this in the jungle. Uh, I just, uh, I'm a little bit uh, awestruck by that. So yeah, that's the uh, that's the concept for the Khmer. Uh, oh, I wanted to reference a few more things. Oh yeah, so here's like some examples of like um, maybe re these are reenactors. I think uh, trying to represent what Khmer royalty might have looked like. Uh, and he, I, Civilization Six included um, Jayavarman the Seventh. I think his name is. Uh, and I think this is the same Jayavarman that built the highway system. Um, very very famous ruler. And then uh, Awe Four kind of did. Uh, I think his name is Suyavarman the Second. Uh, they kind of did him dirty though. He looks like a like an alien or something like that. I don't know why they made him look like that. Um, and then here's some examples of uh, concept art from Civ 6 for uh, what Khmer structures might look like. Very, very distinct architecture. I can imagine this um, looking really good in uh, AoE 4 as well. Uh, same thing with their temples here. Um, just, uh, I think this would look so cool if it got represented in AoE 4. So I, I, I really hope the devs um, uh, implement this Civ uh, and yeah, I think it'd be so fun and so unique and just offers a lot of uh, unique opportunities for uh, gameplay that no other civilization has. I mean, they have ballista elephants, like that's so cool. Uh, all right, um, that is all for me. I think that's everything I have to say about the Khmer. Uh, thanks for listening. Um, if you like hearing about this concept, uh, please give me a like uh, and, cons and consider subscribing if you haven't already. Uh, and I will try to do more in the future. Um, Thanks for listening guys. Uh for those for for everyone out there, stay frosty, stay chilly.